take it away. Thank you, Dr. Stottinger, and I will echo that. Thank you, Matt, for being here today. Um, Matt joined KCU with a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science, both from Binghamton University in New York. While there, he won an undergraduate research award looking at the spread of Lyme disease. From this work, he has given numerous poster presentations and was an invited speaker. Um, he also, also authored two manuscripts, both published in the American Journal of Human Biology, and one of which he is the first author on. Since joining KCU, Matt has served as the founding president of the Note Accords, uh, the vice president of his class, and more recently was awarded the OMM Fellowship on the KCU Joplin campus. Um, this was for the 2019-2020 academic mm -hmm. calendar year. Also during this time, um, he has gained experience lecturing, leading labs as a fellow, mentoring and, tu and tutoring student doctors who are junior to his senior, and gotten involved in research at the MKRC. Uh, he recently worked on the study of Dr. Creamers, which was uh, titled Osteopathic Manipulative Treatment as a Complementary and Integrative Intervention for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder in First Responders. Uh, Matt continued to stay involved during the shutdown, joining us virtually every week for the activities here at the MKRC and taking the initiative to become part of our COVID-19 Journal Club. Uh, if I could remind everyone to please mute their mics and raise their hands if they have any questions, I will turn it over to you, Matt. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Shelley. And thank you, everybody, for being here today and taking time out of your busy schedules. So my talk is entitled COVID-19 in the neonate and child, and there's a lot to talk about today. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm presenting two articles to you all today. One is an article about mechanisms that are similar between Kawasaki disease and COVID-19, because many of you might have heard about the Kawasaki disease-like syndrome that presents in children. And the other is a case study that demonstrates transplacental transmission of the virus. So let's get started. So the first paper focuses on a biochemical immunological pathway called the sting pathway. So I'm gonna start off by giving you guys an overview of this pathway and then discussing some clinical findings that are common to both Kawasaki disease and COVID-19 that suggest the involvement of this pathway. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about thrombotic coagulopathies in both disease processes and why anticoagulants might not be working to their full potential in COVID-19. And then we'll talk about some treatments and then, like I said, I'll finish up with the case study. So the first article is called Kawasaki-like diseases and thrombotic coagulopathy in COVID-19, delayed overactivation of the sting pathway. So first, what is the sting pathway? Sting stands for the stimulator of interferon genes. So as you can imagine, you would think that this pathway would produce interferons. It's involved in innate immunity and also produces cytokines, interleukins, specifically IL-1 and potentially IL-6, and also increases the production of tissue factor. This picture, I wish I could have it on every slide, but it would just take up too much room. So commit this to memory now. There will be a quiz at the end. Just kidding. But what's important to note is that angiotensin II can play a role in this pathway, and this pathway can also be inhibited by aspirin, vitamin D, and IV immunoglobulin. So when talking about COVID, we know it's really complicated because it seems like every day there is a conflicting article about the pathophysiology of this disease, and our understanding is changing rapidly. What we have found is that there has been some endothelial cell involvement in COVID-19 pathology, in addition to type 2 pneumocytes, bronchioalveolar cells, and macrophages. So the authors of this first paper published a previous paper which 
proposed the overactivation of the sting pathway as a mechanism of COVID-19. And this paper delves a little bit further into the specific symptoms that are similar to Kawasaki's disease. Of important note is that in the previous paper, the authors suggested that a mutation in TMEM173 could possibly contribute to the severity of COVID-19, and we're going to be talking a little bit about that later on as well. So the authors presented some evidence for the sting pathway being overactive in COVID patients. And the first conclusion that they drew is that patients who are older, obese, or diabetic are usually the ones that we know have worse outcomes in the disease process. We'll talk about this a little bit later as well, but the sting pathway is already known to be overactive in these patient populations, which further reinforces their hypothesis. Like I said, endothelial cells are involved. They have done some preliminary studies with drugs that block the downstream products of the sting pathway, including IL-6 and JAK-STAT. And those have shown some improvement in clinical outcomes. In addition, the authors talk about an imbalance between ACE1 and ACE2, which are both involved in the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later as well. So in this paper, their main focus was to propose that overactivation of the sting pathway could be involved in both Kawasaki disease and Kawasaki disease-like syndrome in children with COVID-19, and that this pathway could also be contributing to the resistance to thromboprophylaxis in patients who are severely ill and being treated with anticoagulants when trying to treat COVID-19. So for the first point, we're going to talk about some clinical findings that suggest the involvement of the sting pathway. And of course, I had to have a picture of a bee because it's sting. So sorry, I didn't put the rock star. Sorry, Dr. Stoddinger. So first, I want to give you guys a little background as to what Kawasaki's disease is. So it's a systemic vasculitis. We don't really know what causes it. It has been hypothesized that viruses can trigger an episode of Kawasaki disease. So coronavirus, not the current one that we have now, but different versions of coronavirus are known to be triggers, as well as herpes viruses, the BCG vaccine, and just any abnormal DNA products floating around can also induce a Kawasaki disease-like symptom. Kawasaki disease primarily affects medium and small-sized vessels. And as we learned in medical school, the most important consequence of Kawasaki disease is that there can be a delayed occurrence of coronary artery aneurysms. So this is something that pediatricians and family medicine doctors and emergency room doctors really don't want to miss out on diagnosing because this could turn fatal pretty quickly. Some of the mainstays of treatment are going to be high-dose aspirin and IV immunoglobulin. And in order for a diagnosis of Kawasaki disease to be made, the child needs to have a fever of unknown origin for more than five days plus four out of the five following findings, whether it be conjunctivitis, a rash, edema, adenopathy, or mucosal involvement. So we already said that Kawasaki disease can present with the delayed occurrence of arterial aneurysms. They have done previous studies on aneurysms not just the ones involved in Kawasaki's disease, but such as aortic aneurysms. And they found that the tissues involved in that also demonstrate an overexpression of the sting pathway. So it's not too far of a leap to think that it might be involved in Kawasaki disease itself. 
one of the symptoms of COVID-19 that's similar to Kawasaki disease is what we call chillblains-like lesions. And you can see a picture here on the right of what chillblains looks like. So it's mostly in the extremities and you get that swelling and thrombosis in the extremities. And what's interesting is that the genetic variation of chillblains has already been proven to be caused by a gain of function mutation in the sting pathway. So the authors are hypothesizing that overactivation of the sting pathway might be involved in all of these clinical findings that we see with the two diseases. And as a result, the authors recommend that young patients who are diagnosed with COVID-19 be followed for a couple of years and see if they develop the delayed expression of aneurysms, whether it be coronary artery aneurysms, like in Kawasaki disease, just the chillblains lesions in the extremities, or any other type of aneurysm, such as aortic or cerebral aneurysms. The next section of the paper talked about thrombotic coagulopathy and resistance to anticoagulants in COVID-19. So it's already been demonstrated that Kawasaki's disease also increases the risk of thrombosis. And what they found in COVID-19 is that a lot of patients are also in a hypercoagulable state. And this hypercoagulable state, for some reason, is resistant to a lot of the anticoagulants that they're using in the hospitals, such as heparin or factor 10 inhibitors. So one of the mechanisms behind COVID-19 is that it binds to ACE2, which is an enzyme that's going to convert angiotensin 2 into the angiotensin peptides that go and have their systemic effects. And when COVID binds to ACE2, it's reducing its bioavailability and causing an imbalance of ACE1 to ACE2, and therefore you're getting a buildup of angiotensin 2. If you remember back to the sting pathway picture that I presented at the very beginning, angiotensin 2 is one of those molecules that can stimulate the, st the sting pathway. And that's kind of why they're thinking that this might be involved. In addition, if you remember back to the ever popular clotting cascade, um, one of the end products of the sting pathway was tissue factor. And tissue factor, also known as factor three, binds to factor seven and initiates the clotting cascade. So it would make sense that if you increase tissue factor and it binds to factor seven appropriately, you would have the initiation of the clotting cascade. And this is supported by the fact that in COVID-19 autopsies, they have found fibrin deposition in the lung parenchyma. And as you'll see in the case study later in other places as well, and they suspect that this might be due to that overactivation of the sting pathway. The odd part is that anticoagulants, like I said, have not been shown to improve the outcomes in these patients. So they talk about some proposed treatments that might help with this situation. So two drugs that they talk about are dipyridamol, which is a platelet aggregation inhibitor, which also decreases tissue factor activity. The only problem with this drug is that it can also be a purinergic modulator and increase purines, which would contribute to the activation of the sting pathway. So it could have a positive or negative effect. However, aspirin, which if you remember the mechanism of action of that, 
inhibits COX irreversibly and suppresses the production of prostaglandins and thromboxanes. Um, it also acts to acetylate um, CGAS, which will inhibit the sting pathway at an upstream location. And if you remember back to the picture at the beginning, aspirin was shown to be an inhibitor of the pathway. So the authors, this is more of like a logic experiment. They haven't done any actual experimentation with this yet, but the authors suggest that maybe adding aspirin to the typical anticoagulants that the patients are on might improve the clinical outcomes in these patients. And for some of you who are thinking, okay, we're gonna add something that's gonna stop bleeding to another thing that's gonna stop bleeding, or stop coagulation, excuse me. Um, there might be a risk of bleeding in these patients. And the authors address this issue and they cite the COMPASS trial which looked at the use of aspirin, rivaroxaban, or aspirin plus rivaroxaban in patients with coronary artery disease. And that study found that aspirin did not increase the bleeding risk in patients who were taking other anticoagulants, but it did decrease the death rate by a significant amount. I believe it was 23%. And then they kind of add on at the end that it would be also good to keep using the drugs that block sting downstream just to kind of cover their bases. So this is just kind of a proposal of a mechanism that might help to improve clinical outcomes in patients with COVID who have a coagulopathy. So the conclusions of this paper were that the delayed activation of sting might be involved in both Kawasaki disease and COVID-19. And that if you give those patients drugs that inhibit the sting pathway, either upstream or downstream, you would be able to improve clinical outcomes in patients who have this coagulopathy. Next, I'm gonna be talking about the case study which is entitled The Transplacental Transmission of SARS-CoV-2 Infection. So this is a little bit more interactive, I guess. So we have this patient who presented. She was a 23-year-old female. It was her first time pregnant. She was 35 weeks of gestation, and she presented to the emergency room with a two-day history of a fever and a productive cough. The emergency room doctor tested her for COVID and she was found to be positive. On her labs, she had thrombocytopenia, lymphopenia, a prolonged PTT, transaminitis, so her liver enzymes were also elevated. She had an elevated C-reactive protein and ferritin as well. And she was admitted to the hospital for observation. Three days into her admission, there were signs of fetal distress, and you can see that on the right. So they had a category three fetal heart tracing, which was an indication for a C-section to be performed, and that was performed successfully. And since the mother tested positive, they also decided to test the amniotic fluid, and that tested positive for COVID. As for the baby, she gave birth to a 2,500 gram male and the APGAR scores of this baby were four, two, and seven at one, five, and 10 minutes respectively. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with APGAR scores, it's basically a system of screening the health of the baby and usually do it at one, five, and 10 minutes. Normal is around a nine, meaning that the baby is pink and warm and crying and eyes are open and things like that. So this baby was a four, which means that he wasn't in good condition. 
He then decompensated after a couple of minutes, and it wasn't until invasive interventions were taken that the APGAR score finally improved to a seven. The baby was admitted to the NICU and then extubated after about six hours. During this time, they tested the baby for COVID through many different mechanisms. So they tested his blood, the bronchialveolar lavage fluid, a nasopharyngeal swab, and they also did a rectal swab for some reason, but all of these tested positive for the disease. After three days, the child started to demonstrate irritability, poor feeding, hypertonia, and they did a bunch of other tests and metabolic conditions were ruled out. They did a spinal tap to rule out any sort of neurologic cause or infectious cause. The CSF was negative for SARS, for COVID, for bacteria, fungi, and herpes, and it had a normal glucose and a slightly elevated protein level. So this is indicative of viral findings in CSF. And they also did an ultrasound and EEG, but both studies were unremarkable. They decided to get an MRI of the child's brain, which showed bilateral gliosis of the deep white periventricular and subcortical matter. I am not an expert radiologist, so I really appreciated the arrow signs that you can see here. And then a bulk of the paper was about the virology and gross pathologic findings in the different tissues. So here we have the viral load levels from the mom and the baby. And you can see that the nasopharyngeal swab and blood were about the same in the mom, so a viral load of about four. And the amniotic fluid was about a two. In the baby, the blood and nasopharyngeal swab was still pretty low at that one or two, but still positive. What was interesting about this is that the placenta had a viral load of 11, which was much greater than any of the other aspects that they studied. Upon gross inspection of the placenta, you can see that there are areas of infarction. That would be this paler and a little bit redder area in here. And this was found throughout the entire placenta. On histology, these are the villi in here, and you have neutrophils that came in and invaded the inner villus spaces. And then they did a stain for the N protein of COVID-19 and found that this was positive in the placental tissues as shown by this picture here. And that brown staining is all positive COVID staining compared to normal placenta, which is shown in figures B and C here. So it was the first time that it was documented that the virus could possibly be passed through the placenta. And what I found interesting was that you had the infarction in the placental tissue itself. And that got me thinking, maybe if the sting pathway is activated because of COVID-19, that could also explain the findings in the placenta of this study. So I just thought there was an interesting connection between those two. And those are the two articles. So I'll open it up for questions. Uh, can I ask a, a basic sort of layman question? Sure. Uh, uh, could you explain uh, uh, the sting pathway a little bit more is an inflammatory pathway in the body. Uh, sure thing. So, sorry, I'm going to flip through the slides. I'm going to bring that picture up again. So, the sting pathway, basically when it's activated, it's going to work to produce immunologic 
um, molecules that are going to go and try and fight infections. So tissue factor here, this is related to the clotting cascade. So whenever your blood clots, tissue factor is involved in that. Whereas the interleukins, interferons, and cytokines here, these are all involved in immunologic signaling to recruit your immune system to come and fight off whatever viral or bacterial infection is present. Does that help a little bit? So it's, a, it's, a, it's a primary inflammatory uh, immune, immune response system, not anything uh, like, like B cell or T cell modulated. Correct. It's going to be your innate immunity. So that's before the B cells and T cells take over with the adaptive immunity. All right. Thank you. Not a problem. Any more questions for our speaker? I would... Okay. Trevor Hall, go ahead. Hey, Matt. Uh, great hey, job Trevor. today. Um, this might be a question you answered, but I'm folding laundry, so I might have missed it. But um, is aspirin recommended at the beginning when they test positive for COVID, or were they recommending if they see evidence of coagulopathy to start the aspirin? So, yeah, it wasn't like, you know, to prevent a heart attack, you take a daily aspirin mm -hmm. kind of thing. It was if they're determined to have a coagulopathy, then you would start them on the aspirin plus the other stuff. Okay, cool. I wasn't sure if a positive COVID was enough risk of coagulopathy, but that answers my question. Thank you. Yeah, I think the mild forms of COVID don't really have the coagulopathy issue, but the more severe um, presentations, that's when the coagulopathy starts to get involved. So that's when they're suggesting that you add the aspirin. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Boyer has a question. Shelly, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Stoninger, and thank you, Matt, for the presentation. That was very nice. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, I was curious about the mutation that you mentioned, the mm -hmm. TMEM 173. Did you find any other information um, kind of regarding that or what that correlated to with this study? Yeah, so actually, let me go back to the slide that I was just on. So TMEM 173 is the primary genetic mutation that the authors discussed in their original paper. And I guess previous studies have been done on this gene, and it shows that there is a predominance of this mutation in people who live at above a latitude of 35 degrees. So this would be thinking more of your uh, Scandinavian countries, Canada, like all those kinds of things where there are lower vitamin D levels. And if you look at this picture here, vitamin D is an inhibitor of the sting pathway upstream. So that might contribute to why the pathway is being activated in certain populations versus others. So it was an interesting finding, but the authors didn't discuss it as much as I would like them to have done. No, that, that helps. Thank you. Again, thanks no for the problem. presentation. Uh, David Gunderson, your hand is up. Go ahead. Uh, I would like to ask, did the paper discuss um, across populations uh, who is more susceptible uh, to the activation of the sting pathway and then uh, secondarily? I just wanted to ask, in that case study, the, mm -hmm. uh, you said it was there, there was a pulmonary embolism present in the placenta? There or not, was not pulmonary, uh, an envelope. Yeah, there was thrombosis and infarction in the placenta. So at some point, there was a clot that blocked off the blood supply, causing an infarction. And that was that pale area in 
the placenta that you could see on gross examination. So that indicates that there is some hypercoagulable state that was triggered by what they suspect was the virus itself. And, and then, that's... sorry, can you repeat your first question? Uh, did the study uh, look across populations? Uh, like, did they find, like, uh, you know, if children, like, I know that I think the first paper was looking at uh, children with, with the, the Kawasaki like symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, did uh, the first or second paper mention anything about cross populations, like what we would expect in the elderly in, in terms of a, an inflammatory response? So the only thing that they mentioned, this paper was more of a logic and theory kind of paper than uh, hard evidence. Like they were just proposing mechanisms and reasons why this mechanism might be involved. And they mentioned specifically older populations, um, obese populations and diabetic populations. But as far as like race was concerned or socioeconomic status or anything like that, that wasn't discussed in the paper itself. But it is known that those older obese and diabetic populations already have a baseline overactivation of this sting pathway. Okay. And then once they contract the virus, then it's overactivated even more, leading to worse outcomes. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. That was a that was a very succinct an answer. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Any more questions for our speaker? I had a, a comment and and a point of information. The comment I'll make is, soon, Dr. McCullough, it's clear you paid attention in the first year of medical school in your biochemistry <laughs> and immunology courses. So congratulations. Thank you. What I think. What I think this represents, in my view, is a very basic understanding of the molecular pathways that lead to this disease that, in fact, represent therapeutic opportunities for screening for novel ways to inter intervene in Kawasaki disease, uh, per se, and specifically in COVID, hopefully. So this kind of knowledge dissemination that you're doing is super valuable, and by the way, you did an awesome job of presenting it. Thanks. Very, very good. Um, the, I appreciate uh, the opportunity. It's true. Uh, the point of information I'd like to bring to this group is uh, in the chat, for those of you who can see the chat, <clears throat> I put a link to uh, a promotional video for the new president of MSSU who will be speaking in this room on Thursday of next week at, at one o'clock. So for those of you that are interested, uh, that information is linked in the chat. I'd like to turn it back over to Ms. Boyer to uh, promote uh, the next COVID-19 Journal Club participants. Shelley, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Stottinger. Um, I, and thank you again, Matt. I just want to also comment and on what Dr. Stottinger said, it was a conversation that Matt and I had as far as, you know, therapeutic options with COVID-19. People need to, and I've seen papers, people are going back and they're looking at medications, um, different drugs, different small molecules, different things that we have used in the past or that we know have been FDA approved and are no longer using. Um, this is what we have to start doing is going back into our toolbox and seeing what do we have that we can use to target new diseases like this COVID-19. So, um, Dr. Schottinger, I just wanted to follow up on that statement that you made because I, I, I support that and the biochemistry and knowing the foundation there. Um, so, again, thanks, Matt for your talk. Um, next week, we'll have uh, Jess Jackson. She actually has already given one COVID-19 presentation um, so far this summer. So this will be her second uh, follow-up with another one. So I'm very excited to see the new information that Jess is gonna bring to us next week. Um, look for the announcements that I'll be sending out. They will have the papers, um, the title, and just remember the time, one o'clock on Fridays.
So we will see you guys all next week. Thank you for coming. Um, please spread the word. And uh, thank you again, Matt. We appreciate the talk. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. All right, bye. Bye-bye.